It's the end game now. Doctor Strange, you have no idea how right you were. Let's get started. Ba -da -ba -ba -da -ba -ba. Hello, my friends. It's me, Andrew Fantasia. Welcome to Thumb Together. And today, uh, this is a very special uh, video essay that I have planned for you today. This is actually going to be a two-part essay. Normally, I would just review the movie and that would be up on the channel as a movie review, but this is kind of a special case. And I'm still going to review the movie. I'm actually going to team up in true Avengers fashion with Jericho Kane and we're going to do a uh, video review together and that'll be up on his channel. When it is, I'll post a link in the description of this video that take you right to that. But until then, what I wanted to talk about is simply the future of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Now that we have seen Endgame, now that we have seen the fates of all the characters included in this ginormous lineup, what does the future hold for all of the major players in the MCU? I'm going to go over them one by one, and that of course is going to take quite a long time, so I'm going to split this video essay up into two parts. Now, going into this, you need to be warned, major spoilers for Endgame and everything in the MCU. This is spoiler country all the way through. With that said, let's begin. What is the future for all the characters in the Marvel Cinematic Universe? Starting with Doctor Strange. We saw a whole buttload of wizards in Endgame. More so, I think, than we saw in the actual Doctor Strange movie. This made me want to see a more epic-scale war between magic users in upcoming Doctor Strange sequels. The first film, it managed to be epic while still being set on a smaller scale. The Doctor fought Kaecilius and then he fought Dormammu, but it was sort of a small-scale conflict between a small group of wizards. For the sequels, it only makes sense to amp that up. As far as I'm concerned, we only scratched the surface of the world of the mystical, and I can't wait to see what the future has in store for the Wizards and the Sorcerer Supreme. Black Panther. Wakanda's main players are back on the battlefield thanks to the events of Endgame, so I think we can look forward to plenty more cool James Bond-inspired adventures with our favorite African king. I, for one, am really excited to see more politically charged stories involving Wakanda's relationship with the rest of the world. And considering the Captain America stuff is drawing to a close, more on that later, I think Black Panther is the perfect place to get our political superhero fix. Besides, I'm sure there are plenty of nations out there who would love to steal a slice of Wakanda's vibranium pie. Plenty of stories are left to be told in this pocket of the universe. Plus, any excuse to see M'Baku the Man-Ape again is A-OK -okay with me. Captain Marvel Miss Marvel doesn't have a whole lot of screen time in Endgame, despite her being heavily teased at the end of Infinity War. However, she does bring up a very good point in this film. There are thousands of planets in the galaxy, she says to War Machine at one point, and none of them have you guys. One of the coolest aspects of Endgame that I did not see coming was the five-year gap that takes place right after the prologue of the film. During that five-year gap, there are all kinds of crazy things that could have happened to all of our main characters, and Captain Marvel is no exception. I imagine she has had dozens of intergalactic adventures during that five-year gap, and dozens more afterwards. So there's plenty of room for more candy-colored sci-fi goodness as far as she's concerned. Captain Marvel will continue to burn bright for the foreseeable future. Scarlet Witch. Vision may be truly dead, but Scarlet Witch is alive and kicking again. Personally, I always assumed Scarlet would be one of the mainstays going forward, perhaps even leading the inevitable next generation of Avengers once the core team stands down. She's incredibly powerful and she still has a lot to bring to the table. Disney Plus has promised us a heaping spoonful of MCU limited series when it launches this November, one of which will be about Miss Scarlet herself. Since there's no word of her ever getting her own solo movie, I think this is the next best way to tell her stories. But rest assured, Scarlet Witch has a very strong future in this saga, and I can promise you we'll see her again in Avengers 5. Ant-Man. Our boy Scott Lang didn't get to see his daughter grow up, but at least she's still alive and well. 
and thanks to Hulk's actions in Endgame, the Wasp, Hank Pym, and Janet Pym have been returned safe and sound. This means that Ant-Man and his crew of homies are free to embark on more barely legal, micro-sized shenanigans, and now that Scott's daughter is older, maybe she'll become part of the crew. Personally, I think the Ant-Man movies are really underrated, and there's a lot more fun you can have with these characters, and their very unique sets of powers. Spider-Man. So to everyone's massive relief, Peter Parker was returned safely back to the world of the living. We also get to see him happily reunite with Aunt May and his friend Ned, neither of whom look like they've aged five years, which makes me assume that they were also killed during the snap. And you need look no further than the trailer for Far From Home to see that Peter's other classmates, MJ and Flash, have also not aged five years, which means they had to have been snap victims too. This works out to be nice and convenient for us, because we can pick up back where we left off in Spidey's world without missing a beat. And contrary to popular belief, Kevin Feige made a surprising comment recently where he told the news that Spider-Man Far From Home is in fact the final film in Phase 3, not Avengers Endgame. It serves as kind of an epilogue to Phase 3. What that means for Far From Home's plot, we don't know yet. But it's interesting that Spidey is going to be the one to put a neat little bow on the Infinity Saga. Guardians of the Galaxy. Okay, here's where things get tricky. The Gamora we've been following in Guardians 1 and 2 was killed in Infinity War so Thanos could get the Soul Stone. She's dead, period. However, some time travel happened in this movie, and thanks to the time travel, another pre-Guardians 1 version of Gamora was plucked from 2014 and deposited into the present. So the entire Guardians roster is complete once again, except this Gamora sees them all as strangers. So Guardians 3 will most likely involve her integrating herself with the team again and maybe, just maybe, re-sparking her romance with Quill. Now, the movie did create a huge paradox by having future Nebula kill her past self. In any other situation, that's a big no-no for time travelers. By all accounts, future Nebula should have vanished into thin air as soon as past Nebula died. The only explanation I can give here is that Nebula is more machine than human, so the two Nebulas aren't so much the same person as they are copies of the same file, if that makes sense. I don't know. Feige, if you could back me up on this, that would be great. One of the interesting things about this pair of Avengers films that we've just gotten is that Infinity War tried to focus on everybody, and it gave all the characters their own moments to shine, whereas Endgame is much more focused on the core six Avengers, the OG team from back in the first film. Therefore, the futures of the OG team are much more complex moving forward. So, in part two of this video essay, which will air tomorrow, we'll talk about the futures of Hawkeye, Black Widow, Thor, Captain America, Hulk, and Iron Man, and what might possibly happen in their stories moving forward. Stay tuned for that tomorrow, and until then, my friends, adios.